my gosh, Nate, I can't believe you revealed my architecture parentage, which is purely invented, and I feel I like I'm about to become an architectural orphan if any of them catch wind of that. So, yes, thank you, but also big shoes to fill. Hello, everyone. Uh, hi, I'm Joffer. Nice to meet you all. Uh, I kind of feel like I have to start with, like, under the auspices of an apologia, which is that I'm neither a curator, nor am I an expert on Cartier jewelry, nor am I part of Diller's Cafidio Renfro as introduced, um, but I'm a kind of uh, third wheel interloper who worked a lot on this project. Uh, but I'm incredibly excited to be here and very flattered to have been asked. So thank you both to the Dallas Architecture Forum and the DMA for bringing me out from New York. I'm very, very happy to do so. This exhibition took several years of planning and a lot of information that we had to process and download. Uh, so I'm really happy to also be able to think through it. I walked through the galleries. Um, I was actually creeping around while a lot of you were walking in the galleries and overhearing your conversations, which I found incredibly illuminating and fun. Uh, but being able to come back and look at something that you've worked on and thought about is a really interesting thing. Um, and so I appreciate the opportunity. So thank you. Thank you all. And thank you to Kate. Um, I think you were the progenitor of this whole idea. Uh, so the title of this short talk, and I'll try and keep it around half an hour, um, comes from an approach to exhibition design uh, that I find particularly interesting. So I don't know how many of you are architecture people, but um, many of us who are architects and who have kind of dealt in the world of architecture a lot know that architects deal a lot in issues of translation. And primarily, this is translation from two-dimensional drawings to three-dimensional buildings. But there are a lot of other sort of manifestations of these translations. Um, I think exhibition design is one of the most exciting ways that one can translate ideas into space. Um, and for me, the idea of working on an exhibition deals precisely with interpreting curation and curatorial narratives through design and space making um, to give them kind of like a form and a space. So if a lot of you are wondering what kind of exhibition design is or what we do, oftentimes it starts with a lot of conversations with curators and looking through curatorial content and trying to essentially understand that and turn it into an experience that museum goers can have. Um, which is different from a lot of other kinds of work. So uh, as mentioned, my practice, New Affiliates, um, does a whole range of things. We do ground up buildings, we do residential, commercial, public space interventions, adaptive reuse, et cetera. Um, but a lot of our work comes through exhibition making and exhibition design and working with museums and other institutions. Um, which I think is actually one of the funnest parts of what we do. Uh, I started working on this type of work with Diller Scafidio and Renfro, who I worked with explicitly about 10 years ago, and have collaborated on several projects with since. Um, exhibitions are great. They're really fast compared to buildings, and you can test out ideas uh, that speak to design's capacity to address publics and public audiences. Um, and so in this exhibition, I particularly was brought in to look at some of the curatorial stories that maybe would connect through design. So in a way, I was a bit of an intermediary between the curators and the curatorial content and the designers who are kind of laying everything out. Um, as such, I'm gonna focus today on some early thinking and some of the kind of process work um, that led to the exhibition you see today. So not all of the ideas I'm gonna show are directly evident in the show that you see in front of you, but hopefully you'll start to see some hints and through lines throughout. And I'll come back at the very end and look over the exhibition um, that's there at present. Uh, this is a pixelated slide. Um, but that's intentional. Uh, this means, because I'm looking at a lot of the early process work, that I'll be showing a lot of images, diagrams, and sketches that envelop everything from the good, the bad, uh, to sometimes ugly. Um, but just as a way of showing you how we tested and worked through ideas. Uh, so when we were first parsing the content of the exhibition, we were struck by many things. Uh, how references and influences work to produce associations, visual similarities, and sometimes dissimilarities, uh, and importantly, scale. So designing a show of jewelry proposes one pretty, or poses one pretty big problem, which is that a lot of the jewelry, as you saw, is quite tiny. Um, and a lot of the references range from like these large textiles to actual pieces of architecture. Uh, so we were thinking a lot about scale and a lot about content and a lot about this kind of vast amount of information. For those of you who've worked your way through the exhibition, you'll note that there is a lot of stuff in it and a lot of information. And that inherently can be a difficult thing to do because we don't want to overburden audiences to kind of expect them to work through everything with equal hierarchy and importance. Um, 
With most exhibitions, we start with three main questions, which is how I'm going to sort of structure the presentation today. Uh, the first is, how can we interpret the content of an exhibition? The second, how can we spatialize narratives, relationships, and ideas? Uh, and the third is how we can produce an experience for visitors around that content. So I'm gonna kind of look through each of these and maybe talk through why we were thinking through uh, making this show the way that we were. Uh, and actually, maybe I should clarify one thing. So I don't think this was brought up in the introduction, but we were, is this, this is public, right? We can talk about the competition, yeah? Yeah, I'm asking you, and yeah, Heather, Sarah, anyone, curators, yeah. So the, the project started with an invited competition, um, and this would have been in March 2020, uh, a month we all probably remember quite vividly for a lot of reasons. Um, or at least our work on the competition started then. Uh, so a lot of these ideas come from the competition stage when we were really thinking a lot more abstractly about how to kind of produce a show and basically say, here's where architecture or design might have stake in the experience that might happen. Um, Anyway, so that's like a little bit of background that maybe will get us forward. Uh, so the first question, how to interpret content. Uh, when we first started to look at the checklist, which initially included something like 700 plus objects, uh, maybe even more, uh, we were struck not just by the breadth of content, uh, but also the different ways that Cartier was using reference. Uh, this ranged from the abstract, looking at patterns and motifs and geometries, to the figural, borrowing icons, symbols, and sometimes even direct material content, which I'll talk about a little bit more. The media and the references ranged, as I mentioned earlier, from textiles to drawings drawings, to drawings of architecture, uh, to architecture and photographs. Uh, some of the material included European contemporaries in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, including Owen Jones or Jules Bergon, who I will refer to a few times today, looking at Islamic ornament and design. The references could be based on material, they could be based on color, uh, and their outcomes, as in this Cartier Diadem, uh, drew from and combined multiple reference sources to create something new and hybrid. You might be wondering where space comes in, but I'll get there in a moment. This was really first about us looking at the content itself and trying to find inspiration of it, from it. As designers and architects, we were really intrigued, um, not only by the references, but by how the references operated. So in this case, the idea of applying uh, a decorative pattern or a drawing or a two-dimensional sort of reference image over three-dimensional work. So in this case, looking at how uh, a pattern can apply itself to kind of relief text. Um, and then to see how that may have taken form in some of the Cartier pieces. So as you may have noticed, for those of you who've seen the exhibition, a lot of times you see how the jewels basically look like they take a flat pattern and then wrap it around to create a three-dimensional form. Obviously, that happens a lot in Islamic architecture and decorative art. Uh, and as designers, we were just fascinated by that. It's such a simple premise, but actually produces such elaborate and beautiful results. Uh, we looked at different geometries. We looked at kind of color and structure, which I'll come back to, and form all pieces that you've seen. And we just found ourselves looking, looking at um, the pieces, looking at Cartier, looking at the pieces, trying to embody all of these different perspectives in order to understand what and how the show might operate. And uh, we came up with this diagram really early on, which I think we may have submitted in the competition entry, but I can't quite remember. Uh, and we became aware of this idea of looking as a kind of nested method, right? So this wasn't just about Cartier looking at Islam, but it was actually us, you know, we're the, the outer ring, I include myself in the design team here, um, looking at the curators, looking at Cartier, looking at Europe, because actually it wasn't just Cartier looking directly at Islam, but a sort of milieu of projects around Western Europe being interested in the Arab and Islamic world in the late 19th and early 20th century, then looking back to Islam. And then for each of these um, relationships, these relationships of looking, there was a corresponding medium. Uh, so in Islam, there was the object, which as Europe was looking at it, turned into an artifact, uh, which then as Cartier look, looked at it, turned into a design. And then as the curators looked at it, maybe turned into a collection or the checklist that we worked with. And finally, we looked at it through a kind of act of mediated interpretation, which I'll come back to. Um, but this was a way for us to kind of organize the information, the material, and the kind of method by which we were understanding the work in front of us. We also started to try and categorize the work. Again, just keep in mind we were looking at like a maybe even an eight or 900 item checklist. I can't remember, it was outrageous. Uh, and we needed to start to impose a little bit of uh, logic to it, some rules. 
And so we started making up our own categories. Again, we're not jewelry people, we're architects, we're designers, we're not historians, so um, you know, those who might have more information may have done this differently. But for us, as sort of third-party observers, we started looking at some pieces that just wanted to stand alone, others that formed pairs, so looking at kind of resonances in, in material or form, object families, as in the case with sort of emerald pieces based on color, inspirations, so looking at paintings that may have produced different formal typologies that didn't exist at Cartier before, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, motifs, which of course are explicitly given to us by the curators, narratives, which I'll come back to, but really lead from the reading of an inspiration that turned into an actual Cartier piece, series, and this uninspired, uninspired category we call other, um, which are just things that didn't quite fit anywhere else. We also started looking at degrees of influence. Um, I will not embarrass myself by saying how much random things we were reading, how many random things we were reading, how much theory kind of entered into our, into our minds, but um, looking at the kind of relationship between direct versus indirect influences and references, this is kind of the heart and soul of the show to us. And again, we'll come back into the design a little bit later. Uh, but things ranging from the apprets in the lexicon of the show, which are also ready-mades, where actual pieces were taken from the subcontinent and then embedded into Cartier objects, all the way through to kind of like acts of abstraction and then everything along the way in the spectrum. Uh, we were really intrigued by this because reference and influence then to us took a completely novel form. Um, this also appeared even in like families of necklaces, for example. So on the left, uh, you see something that has kind of embedded a pretz in it. And then on the far right, you see something that feels completely abstract. And maybe if you looked at this, you wouldn't quite know that it was Islamic. But if you look at its DNA and you understand its connection to other families of objects, it starts to make a little bit more sense. So this idea of layering and looking at things together really did work its way into the show from the outset. And I will intersperse a few images of the things that you see in the gallery. Um, but in this case, we knew from the start that we always wanted things to appear in kind of layers of depth, that no object would ever really be seen alone without a kind of context or relationship that is associated with it. So even as you walk into the gallery at first, you see essentially the kind of foreground layer of these object pairs where you see a direct re uh, reference pair between, in this case, a tiara and a textile. Um, and then as you look back, the show kind of always evolves. Even if you can't walk into those spaces, you always see a kind of past, present, and future and ways that objects can kind of form complex networks of relations. So this was really built in to the very beginning of how we thought about the show from our reading of a lot of objects. On the topic of interpreting the objects themselves, we knew we wanted to give some sort of additional information that might not be evident from the first look at some of the pieces. So in this case, we very simply wanted to be able to see the backs of the objects. We wanted to understand and analyze the structure. This is like a very, um, goofy structural diagram, uh, but it was something that we were sort of testing out that led to the more spectacular animations that you might have seen in the galleries now. Every elaborate, beautiful idea that starts with a kind of dumb diagrammatic one, uh, but to reveal something, because again, as architects and designers, these pieces are coded with so much information um, that we think is so interesting. Through to interpreting the way that geometry, pattern, uh, fractal, and in some cases tessellation worked, uh, which then led us down another rabbit hole, which is that what seems so endemic to Islamic art and architecture has to do with these things like infill patterns, uh, the role of the infinite, uh, of horror vacui, the fear of emptiness, which seems to kind of underlie this desire to kind of cover everything in, in pattern and decoration. Um, and that led to certain design narratives, I suppose, or design tracks on our side. So our interest in some of these topics in, in the infill and the infinite led to the desire to create something where we could apply surface as a kind of architectural or spatial experience. And I'll talk more about experience later on. But for us, this was still at the level of kind of interpreting the content. So we wanted to interpret how the objects function, what was interesting about them, and what could be architectural about them, and turn those into an atmosphere, for example, this led to the design of a thing that we called the infinity room, um, which I think you'll see some through lines in the show that we have now. Uh, but this basically meant projecting patterns onto a wall and then wrapping uh, the kind of lip around that wall with mirrors so that it appeared to be an infinite projection. So you could stick your head in this little diorama and you would see the kind of reflection of the infinite pattern um, endlessly repeating itself. 
There were other sort of tracks around abstraction other than just like the, kind of the role of the infant that we were interested in, including the rules and the logics of some of the geometries. Again, this comes a lot from late 19th century um, Western uh, eyes looking towards Islam, in this case, Jules Bourgogne, who I mentioned earlier, uh, looking at the elements of Arabic art. Um, we had this idea that we would maybe want to apply a similar analysis to some of the pieces to find the rules that are encoded in the Cartier jewels and to link them to something that felt resonant with the idea of Islam, not in a superficial way, but in a kind of rhetorical logical one. Uh, this actually led us down another strange rabbit hole early on, uh, which is that we noticed this amazing connection between this drawing, the series of drawings and analytical drawings on the left by Bourgoin and a Salouet wall drawing. Um, and it made us think, again, not art historians, this is like a very broad reaching scent of, uh, set of dilettantish acts, uh, but we noticed this resonance in the Solowit wall drawings and started to ask ourselves if there was something in this idea of series or the variant or variations or rule where maybe we could actually use the Western eye looking towards Islam in the early 20th century as a seed to plant an idea that this could have led somehow to abstraction and abstract art as a kind of high modern act. Uh, this is probably well outside of what an exhibition designer should do, but we got very excited about it and fell down the rabbit hole. Um, but then, you know, we found a lot of these design drawings by Cartier's studio uh, really interesting in the context of looking at the idea of variation, for example. And while I don't think we felt super confident that we could claim this as an absolute connection, it felt interesting enough to imply a sort of indirect reference. Um, that would then connect us all the way through to much more famous pieces by Decker, Stella, or Agnes Martin, for example. Um, and this led to a moment that was uh, lost to us, but where we actually almost had one of the pieces in the show here um, that sort of fell out with another couple other decisions. Uh, but this did carry through to kind of late stage discussions that we had with the curators, which was really fun for us. So if the first kind of category was about how to interpret content, the second question we ask, ask ourselves is how can we start to spatialize these narratives? Um, so a lot of these sketch ideas really I don't know, relate to how an audience member might experience something through interpretation. Uh, but we also have to put objects in space. It's a big part of what we do, of course. Um, and this started with, again, an observation about some of the content where we felt as though there were different relationships between objects that we wanted to understand a little bit better. Uh, so a really dumb pairing of examples. And again, this was just coming from our eye, not the curators necessarily, but in some cases, a single reference, as you see on the left, would lead to a lot of different designs by Cartier and sketches. So it kind of bred all of these different iterations and versions. Whereas on the right, you might see how several different references, the kind of cloud around, all fed the same Cartier object. So there's a kind of inverse. It's like one reference to many objects, one object to many references, et cetera. Uh, again, going back to this idea of the apprets, building an existing thing into a design felt really interesting to us in a completely different way than these relationships. And we made a, a very goofy diagram. I don't think this was ever meant to be shown publicly, um, but I think it's interesting, again, to show some of the, the kind of working content. I don't, did we ever show this to you all? Hmm, yeah, no. Well, surprise, this has been around for two years. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this was a kind of internal way of us tracking some of the content to ourselves. So simply put, uh, things in red are Cartier objects, things in black are references or influences. We, I guess we call this ways of interpreting object relationships. I don't know, it's early stage. Um, but again, just to kind of trace out some of these relationships, there were explicit relationships between things, what we called implicit ones, where maybe the, the connection was a little bit less direct. There were deliberate breaks from reference, so an idea of two objects relating in so far as they don't relate in a really overt way. That sounds weirder than it was when we were looking at the content. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, one design, many references, or one reference, many designs. Stories of translation, so starting with a reference and then drawing it out into a design object. A change in media, taking a textile and turning it into a tiara. Abstraction, which I think we've covered, but the idea of taking something that has a certain degree of articulation and reducing it so it becomes a kind of more abstract version of itself, and embeddedness, which again goes back to this guy here. Um, this started to lead to design proposals, which maybe seem quite literal, uh, but felt like they had some promise, and, and we were hoping to layer all these things and build them together into something new and novel and interesting. Um, so in this case, taking two things that relate to each other and just kind of building them into a single vitrine. 
We had ideas of entire rooms, and this was done in, in direct conversation with the curators, rooms where you'd have four paired objects um, to really make these connections quite direct and literal. Here's a version where we have one reference that leads to many objects, so maybe a table uh, where you see kind of propped up vertically, the thing that refers to all the things that are on the, the horizontal surface. Um, this maybe is an explicit moment to talk about the way that some of the objects came to be and things that we really found interesting. So starting with the 15th century illuminated manuscript, watching the kind of Cartier design drawings that maybe emerged through looking at that object uh, that then turn into explicit design drawings. And these design drawings are some of my favorite pieces in the show. They're quite spectacular and beautiful. That then led to the kind of creation of a case. And then you start to see these objects all over the show and maybe think about the implied relationships they have with the content that you see around them. Uh, other ideas through spatializing narratives include what we called the King Wall. Um, again, early ideas, but I think you see a reference in Gallery 8 in this, in this show as well. Um, but here, this amazing portrait of uh, a person whose eyebrows I truly admire um, that actually shows a series of... Um, of jewels that obviously have led to a lot of the Cartier pieces. So the aigrette um, headpiece, which you see in this show, a Cartier version of, the bazu band, the armband, the tassel. And our idea was that you would actually kind of produce the portrait and then produce its twin right next to it, and then have all of those objects shown in real space so you get a sense of all the relationships together. Um, and this was kind of part one of the object narrative. Part two, if you notice this little window around the tassel, would lead you to the opposite side of the wall where you'd actually see a taxonomy of of other like tassels. Um, so we were trying to always begin with a seed of information and then kind of let it grow into something maybe a little bit surprising or unexpected. Uh, this is the egret um, that we see in the show today, uh, shown very abstractly against a black background. This Kind of thinking around the King Wall um, also led us to think a little bit more about the role of embodiment in the show. So um, this is something that is obviously implied by jewelry. It's wearable, of course. Um, and we had to think long and hard about how we wanted to deal with embodiment. This was um, an interesting example because it really does show a type that probably did not exist in kind of like Western jewelry before the kind of reference uh, to this other world, and then led to one of the most spectacular pieces that I love um, from the Cartier collection. This idea of embodiment also led us to this piece, which um, probably some of you who have seen the show will recognize, what we call the breathing necklace. Um, so we allowed ourselves, in conversation with the curators, I'm sure they, they sort of forced our hands at some point, but uh, we allowed ourselves one moment to kind of incorporate the body vis-a-vis -vis the Cartier pieces, and it was this robotic, um, Form that basically began with one of the flattest pieces in the show, this incredible hexagonal necklace that I showed in an earlier slide, uh, which would appear very abstractly as a flat object, and then the figure would kind of take form underneath it and bring it up and give it volume. Um, the body in this case is obviously quite, um, it's both literal but also not overly figural, I guess maybe if I can make that distinction. Um, we wanted to kind of imply how wearability gives form and life to these without kind of over-literalizing um, a person or a figure. Uh, and so here you see it as well from the side. Final category, uh, final question. I have no idea how I'm doing on time. Someone just like throw a book at me or something. Um, so the final question is how, how can we produce an experience? And for us, and for me personally and for my practice and probably what I've learned from Liz in working with DSR is one of the most urgent questions now. Um, there's an obvious primacy to physical artifacts. I think we can all agree that to that. There's a value in seeing them in real space. You have all come here tonight. I think all of you have demonstrated a care for you know, in-person attention. Uh, but obviously there are a lot of questions when you see exhibitions, which is like, why not look at the catalog? Why not go on the website? Why not look at this in a kind of two-dimensional material? There's a very famous um, book by Malraux called The Museum Without Walls that was written in the mid 20th century, which essentially proposes that museums could be thought of as obsolete if you look at the history of museums in, in the world, um, and that they could just basically be reproduced as uh, two-dimensional artifacts. So for us as architects and designers, this question is like, yeah, how, how do you make an experience? How do you make it necessary for people to come in and see a show? Uh, and, and this one really drives us a lot. Um, ignore the words here. I really wanted to be 
true to our process, so I just kind of collected a lot of material we produced along the way. Um, but I wanted to include this slide because obviously there is something immersive and spatial and experiential about the kind of reference from Islam altogether and the way that pattern, ornament, decoration, and all of these kind of motifs that we've discussed throughout um, play out at the scale of building. And so this was in our minds. We were thinking through this very explicitly. These are not references that were given to us by the curators, by the way. These are just ones that we were looking around for while we were in early stages of the show. Uh, but this idea of being under, surrounded by, enveloped by image and surface and texture and, and architecture felt really important to how we could deal with the show itself. And we wanted to bring a spirit of that into the exhibition that you see. Um, we haven't really talked about this in the introduction either, but the show uh, had a first iteration in Paris and um, at the Musée d'Arts Décoratif, and then it came here afterwards. Um, and so we had two spaces to deal with, and we were trying to think about experience in two different ways, but with the same basic rule, um, which is that for us, as, as the designers of the exhibition, we wanted to make sure that there was a variation in the kind of rhythm of the show. Uh, we wanted to be aware that it's actually a lot of content and stuff to see for, for a visitor, as I mentioned earlier. And we wanted to give breaks and to give sort of breathing moments where you could kind of unfocus your eyes from the kind of tiny object right in front of you and actually look at something that was more that was more like large scale and, and immersive. Um, so in Paris, this is sort of irrelevant to the conversation, but in Paris that had to do with a kind of constant re-engagement of a large nave space in the galleries. And in Dallas, the show that you see in front of us today, um, it's these yellow rooms, which you might recognize as where those big animations are with the single vitrines with like the kind of spectacular objects. And then this kind of large area in the middle that's book ended by two large scale projections. Um, there's obviously other projections in, in the gallery, but for us to have a kind of heart of the exhibition that allowed visitors to see differently um, was really important to the kind of formulation of an experience uh, for us. A lot of this, very simply, had to do with, again, scale, one of the first things I said today. Uh, we wanted to just blow things up, uh, not literally, but um, we wanted to zoom in on them and to allow them to take a completely different, maybe uncanny, unfamiliar, unrecognizable scale. So we very early on had this, had this thought that we would basically just zoom into things. Um, this is an animation that exists, uh, but very perversely and very simply, the idea of starting with a miniature and making it maximal, maximal mature, uh, felt like a kind of interesting thing to do, to give it a kind of new new experience. This also took the form of things that were more abstract, which didn't necessarily work their way into this show, but you know, the idea of just shadow projection, taking the silhouettes of objects and treating them as kind of architectural interventions. All of these things, the idea of zooming in, the idea of the shadow, the idea of analysis, led to uh, one of the kind of notable parts of the exhibition, um, this is a four minute animation, so I'm not gonna show the whole thing, uh, which was the creation of these four animations um, that really were about Zooming in, looking at an architectural reference, treating it as something maybe a little bit didactic, but that also helps to explain um, through a kind of experiential narrative how these pieces took you know, an architectural influence and then turned them into a jewelry design. I don't know if I can scrub. Yeah, I can scrub there. Um, so these, of course, begin with, a, and a, we, we could not, as architects, not, not be seduced by how tectonic and how structural a lot of these were. I mean, I think in general, architects could probably learn a lot from jewelry design, and I think historically jewelry design and architecture have, have a long kind of conversation. Um, but really getting nerdy about the way these things got put together, uh, the way that surfaces could sort of bend themselves into forms felt really exciting to us, um, as mentioned before. Uh, the way that they can apply themselves to a substructure I mean, it's just so funny to think of this as an architect because so far in this animation, you think of them at the scale of a building and then suddenly it's like on a tortoise shell thing with things that look like they go in your hair and, and it's very confusing and odd. Um, but even down to the details of how they're sort of like pinned together, uh, this all felt really exciting for us in a way of giving an experience that might not otherwise uh, be available. So I'll end with talking through maybe how some of these experiences led to the exhibition you see um, today and where maybe they tie together. So this is our entry wall. Um, here, this idea of interpretation uh, you know, begins. I showed another image of this first room earlier on where I was talking about layering. Um, in this case, also creating a pair between the silhouette projection and the piece beyond, and then obviously to the far, this side. Sorry, I'm probably a little bit too frenetic with the mouse, but it helps me see what I'm trying to say. Um, 
to us, this was really interesting because we actually learned about the pieces along the way. Like, I don't know if you remember, Sarah, but at a certain point when we were doing this kind of negative um, animation, we discovered motifs within the piece that we didn't know about, and it was these two bird heads. And uh, actually, our act of processing and interpreting led us all to have these kind of like moments of discovery along the way. Here's the view back looking at the projection of the tiara, um, which is next to this little crystal vase, um, back to the, to the exit wall. Uh, that was another kind of exciting moment for us. Spatializing the references. So in this case, um, you know, we have these playful moments in the show where we'll take a vitrine and we'll slip it out of the wall. That both is just kind of a fun thing to play with as a designer, but it also locates this piece, um, the stress form, in the next gallery. So it's always about kind of bringing visitors through to the next space. Uh, and in that room, as many of you probably noticed when you saw today, uh, we really wanted to use a sort of active interpretation uh, to reveal something about how all these objects worked culturally in the early 20th century. So this is a series of projections that begin with actual artifacts. Um, and then we called this, I think, the timed vitrine room. Um, and it, one artifact would be highlighted. And then on all the other windows, you would see other similar things that happened in this kind of cultural milieu of Paris in the early 20th century. The idea being to say that like, actually all of these artifacts are actually representational and depict a much broader story, and that was really important to the way that Cartier was designing at that time. Um, so again, to reveal things that might not otherwise be in space, but also only made possible through the experience of walking through the galleries. Uh, of course, as mentioned previously, the idea of augmenting the artifacts and having these animations. But in this case, obviously, uh, for us, the important thing isn't just the animation. It's that the animation and the actual artifact can coexist together uh, so that one always plays off the other. And what's interesting is that, you know, Hopefully you all had this experience, but the idea was never to overwhelm the actual artifact. I mean, I think to me, the artifact itself is still more spectacular than the massive animation, even though it's brighter and bolder and kind of more um, immersive. Uh, but it's the pairing between the small and the large, the kind of power of the effect of the immediate thing and then the kind of distal thing that's about analyzing it. Uh, we did the same act, of course, with, with four of, of these things that we called the hero objects. Um, and they ranged from kind of looking at material to looking at reference, um, to looking at structure, to drawing out a kind of diagram of how, how these pieces could work. In the context of the show, uh, you know, we, we really wanted to keep things open so that you could always, again, see things against one another. So in this case, the, the room in the middle that's bookended by those two large animations has in its periphery, kind of flickering in the background, these uh, analytical animations that are happening at the same time. Um, but then you also have the immediacy of the thing that's happening in front of you. Um, here, you know, the, the actual objects are lit so that you can make a connection between where that artifact is in the gallery and the space beyond. Uh, likewise, I mean, always creating new new sort of connections with the animated content. You know, this, this crown has no relationship with the thing that's happening beyond. Um, but I think in conversation with the curators, we wanted to avoid always making narratives super explicit and to allow visitors to have their own experience and make their own connections. So in a way, it's just like letting things coexist in space sometimes in order to allow new kind of syntheses to happen uh, is, is really important to the way that we approach exhibitions. Looking at the same pieces against different backdrops, always revealing new, new sort of relationships. Uh, you'll notice a kind of resonance in this image to the pixel vitrine that I showed very early on um, with the two pieces that just kind of like plug into one another. Um, again, showing how this object might relate to these above and then to the pieces below. So always about a kind of spatial layering, um, objects floating in the background, et cetera. And then really beautiful moments where you sort of zoom in on one piece while seeing another behind it, um, just to kind of reveal how these structures are infinitely scalable. Um, one thing about, obviously, the way that Islamic art and architecture work is that the kind of idea of the infinite and the abstraction uh, are introduced as a way of approximating the divine and creating a relationship to the divine. And where those moments kind of happened, either accidentally or intentionally in the exhibition, was really kind of compelling and beautiful to us. Uh, simply pre preserving some of our really early ideas about always being able to see the backs of objects, to walk around them, to let them exist sometimes uh, in solitary uh, 
relationships just with themselves or their reflection was, was important. This is our kind of nod to the portrait, the king wall from the previous one, a painting I prefer even more with a person with even better eyebrows, um, but creating a relationship again to the pieces around. Rhythm in the show was really important to us, like having moments of intensity and moments of, of kind of relaxedness. Um, playing out all the different ways the casework kind of held, held objects in groups, uh, for example. This is like zooming in, um, always allowing people to kind of move forward and back and to focus and defocus a sort of sight line. One of the things um, that is both interesting and difficult about an exhibition like this, and maybe the last thing I'll talk about before turning over to a conversation, um, is how to kind of create life in a show. Uh, one of the things that's really tough about exhibitions, especially of objects that want to be used, and I referred to this a little bit in talking about embodiment, is that they become inert and they become lifeless when they're not in use. So you'll probably notice this if you see exhibitions of decorative furniture, um, you know, the classic period room exhibition. Um, there's a way in which as you take bodies and you take use out of the equation, suddenly how do these objects ever perform the way that they could or want to. So inserting dynamics into the mix is really important to us. And that's not just about animated content. It's not about making movies. It's not about making dynamic things. But sometimes it's as simple as just lighting something differently. Um, so in the case of some of these amazing emerald pieces, trying to bring depth and life to them to allow the pieces to speak beyond just kind of like lying there a little bit lifeless. This comes from, um, I mean, I think Diller Scafidio has been doing this for a long time. But I, my personal journey is that I, I sort of learned it through working on projects with them. In this case, two shows that I did with them almost a decade ago. The one on the left, a show of um, a British couturier called Charles James that was shown at the Met in New York in 2013 or 14. Um, and the other, a, a show of the work of Pierre Chereau, um, who was responsible for this incredible house in Paris called the Maison de Verre, but also a furniture designer. I think both of these led us to really ask specifically, like, how do we bring life to things that are being denied life? Um, and, and that can very simply be put as, as use. And so we, we think about that. And hopefully, a lot of the examples that I've shown up until now maybe support us trying to breathe life into them alongside with the curators. Um, this is uh, one of the emerald necklaces at the very end, where you see the light coming in from the back. And then, of course, um, back to the breathing vitrine. Um, this is like really where we, where we think to go with the show. And I guess we're all end, so we can have a nice conversation about it. Thank you. Um, thanks, Joffer. Uh, that was great, and I think it was a really good way to set up the conversation. Obviously, we heard from your perspective, so I'm really glad that Sarah's up here now to speak from the curatorial perspective. I just want to give a caveat that we are um, foregoing a question and answer from the audience tonight because we have a little, uh, we don't have tons of time, and so we want to keep the, the conversation flowing. But if you have any specific questions afterwards, Sarah and Joffer will be here for just a couple of minutes, um, and you can come up and talk to them. So um, I actually wanted to start with the concept of the body that you were referring to and how to bring life to an object, because I think that there's a difference between bringing life to an object and talking about how to represent something that's on the body in a way that people can relate to. And Sarah, I know that that is something um, that you were thinking about during this, during this whole process. So I'm wondering if you all could talk a little bit about how you show something that should be on a body floating in space and how to relate it back. So I know um, that I have done, um, when I was doing an exhibition with uh, Iris Van Herpen, which was a show that came here as well, I was talking to her a lot about how she felt about the, her couture work, the difference between it being on a runway and being in an exhibition. And what she said to me, which is I think a lot of how I think about stuff is that when it when you see it walking down the runway when you see people wearing jewelry you understand the movement and the intentionality that the designer go, puts into it and that the body is always a part of the factor of what's happening but what she said was the horrible part is nobody could ever see in those minutes how much effort and energy and, and craftsmanship went into the piece and when they're static they become what you really start to see is all those details and all those elements and I think, you know, one of the really interesting things with this show, 
was um, if you really start to look at some of these Cartier pieces, there's a tremendous amount of Im what I'd call embedded diamonds that are there for the sparkle factor. And you really see them only when you're moving light across them. And that was something we could never capture. And so it is really like if you go in again with your cell phone and turn your light on and you move them, you start to see how moving around with them, the light really changes that. And that that's a kind of a story we could never tell, mm. except maybe with that one moving piece. But I do think it's, it was a challenge. I think it's just something you accept of whether you want to lean in to the wearability factor in the body or you want to say it's kind of um, separate. And I think for this show, I liked the idea that it sort of came at the end. We really just sort of looked at them as objects we really wanted. There's only so much stuff people can take out of a show and you have to kind of focus your narratives. And I think for this show, we really wanted people looking at these ideas of these motifs, looking at how they move across, you know, these geographies that over time and, and through these different media. And so it's like, you can't also start bringing the body into that too, in a way. But we tried little things, right? Like we tried to put things at heights. Um, I like to say when we were installing, everything was my height. Um, so, so if you're my height, it's a great show. Um, but <laughs> you got to be like five three. Um, but you know, it's trying to understand like the TR pieces were often higher. We would try and put. So we were trying to make s some subtle references to the body, if possible. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a great example of um, obviously a collaborative relationship. Like, you know, I think we. I remember conversations like this with you early on where we would talk about, you know, all the curators and just like body, nobody, body, nobody. And I'm sure there was like internal discussions among the curators about whether there should be a body or nobody. And, um, you know, I, I can see it both ways. And at a certain point, like we, we just wanted to kind of work with you guys on the show that made sense to you. And I think that the, the kind of point that you're making about having the pieces there without embodiment makes a lot of sense and it makes them read differently. So I think it's just one of those many things along the way where we were like, could be excited about any direction. Like if you all had said to us, yeah, we, we want everything to be embodied. We could have made that show and it would have been great and it would have been a lot of fun for us. Um, but I think there were other things to focus on too. I remember one of the comments when you, because you showed during the, the proposal, you know, these kind of like hand, these disembodied kind of hands. And um, one of the people who was on this panel reviewing was saying, oh, a lot of times the public kind of freaks out when it's just like disembodied, dismembered hands and necks. And I was like, oh, that's so interesting. You know, like it, it's all, there's always a million questions and you just make choices. And I think the key with this show and in the end result was we kind of stuck with this floating, um, yeah. these mounts that make the object really just kind of be its own like ethereal thing. There was one, one moment I remember where, um, we wanted to have like three of the animated vitrines. I mean, there's like, it's obviously really great to have it. I feel like I'm getting a lot of feedback. Um, not actual feedback, auditory <laughs> feedback. Like <laughs> no one's giving me feedback right now. Um, I, yeah, and I remember us saying like, what if we did uh, three of them? And that would be really weird because then you would kind of make audience members like look for more along the way. Like they might be like really confused, like which one's going to move, which one's going to move, and it becomes this kind of Easter egg that you find. Obviously, there's like an elegance to having it at the end only, and I, I think it works really well. Uh, but I do remember us talking at one point about like, okay, wouldn't it be great if you had like one at the beginning, one randomly in the middle, and one at the end, just to make it this guessing game and this kind of constant frustration. I just came back from Disneyland, so I'm just imagining like uh, disembodied mechanical body parts <laughs> stationed okay. throughout this exhibition. Um, I also, I wanted to get into a little bit about the language that you all developed together because Sarah, you come from a background that is steeped in architecture, but you're a curator with architectural knowledge. Joffer, you're sort of the opposite, where you are an architect with some working knowledge of, of curation. So how did you all, from the beginning, start to work together to develop a language where you could make sense of each other's work and have it work harmoniously towards an end goal? That implies we succeeded in doing that. <laughs> What's your take on that? Um, I think it was, I mean, we, and we're representative of a larger group of people that were at the yes. table with larger conversations. So this is just kind of our point of view of it. I think what was um, 
the end goal was always making an incredible exhibition and was taking a lot of the research and the ideas that the curatorial team had done, that Cartier has about their own objects, what you guys were bringing, and trying to figure out how do you make this a visual experience and how do you make this, I mean, and I think that was what was so compelling about the proposal that was done by you guys was he really was about looking and it was about who was looking and what they were seeing and how that starts to move through these layers. And I think that is the thing that to me is so successful about the show. And we talked a lot about this, about not making these literal um, kind of walk through narratives, but that you were always pulling, you were kind of leaving little threads and little tidbits and you might pick them up again later in the exhibition. You might, you're starting to always shift. I always um, think about it a lot as like a kaleidoscope. And a lot of times you have the same elements, but you're just rotating it slightly into the gallery to look at it through a different lens. And I think that's where, um, for me, the connection with your team, you guys was so um, sympathetic mm. that we were trying to always think about how is the visitor going to take all this information and process it through the objects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, a, I like that answer. I don't know. I don't know what I have to add other than I think, um, there were a lot of voices at the table um, throughout and coming up with a common language I think actually was impossible um, and I don't mean that in a bad way at all actually I think that it was very like heterogeneous and what happened is that because everyone came I mean I think all of the curators came with different perspectives like on our side I think you know we have different perspectives on our side no one really shared the same opinions um, but what that meant was that every idea was kind of being both supported and attacked from all sides. And I think it made the kind of end result a lot more robust because it was basically emerged through a lot of different perspectives. And it wasn't just like, oh, we miraculously all have the same viewpoint. I hope you all enjoy it. It was more like, well, none of us did. And therefore the thing that emerged actually was almost like a core nugget, like an efficient idea of a thing where all the fat had been necessarily kind of like chopped off. Yeah, uh, well, and I think with a checklist of, Eight, how many? Well, in the end, it was only like 400 and something for here. For but the, here, the starting yeah. checklist for the proposal phase was like an eight or 900, I think. We loved our objects. Well, so many objects. And so the, the curatorial vision and, and you know, getting the early concepts to play into that narrative and coming together to start to understand how you could both achieve that goal, um, I think I sat in on some of those meetings and they were long. <laughs> and they were extremely involved. And I think in the time of COVID, when everything was trying to happen over Zoom, um, also created a bunch of roadblocks. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, and again, as part of the larger team, some of the roadblocks that were set up that would, in, in the end, it is an incredibly beautiful show. And all of that language was, was, was parsed out. And Sarah was lucky enough to go to New York to actually sit down and filter through these things literally sort of one by one. And so talking about a little, some of the challenges that were presented along the way that uh, could have sidelined some of this. I love we always look at each other. Um, hey. I think, you know, what's interesting, I mean, this was a project that was over four and a half years and, you know, different people sort of were brought in. There was um, a period pre-COVID where there was a lot of kind of intense trips and more like um, with the curatorial team of really connecting and trying to understand how we were going to make the show, what we were going to do, who was going to write what, and all these kind of parsing of these ideas. By the time um, the DSR and you entered into this equation was right at the beginning of the pandemic. And all of a sudden, everything moved to Zoom, and every all these conversations were like 25 people on these calls and trying to under in different time zones, and it just changed the whole way we worked. And I think some things, in a way, became longer because they were just these long, drawn out things. But I think it was, um, and it was hard because we're all visual people who want to be touching things and drawing on things and you, you were kind of stuck having to use your words and fight to get in line to be the one to talk. So I think that, uh, to me, that made it harder to sometimes make connections with people and read the body language in the room and sort of work through them. Yeah, I think that's totally right. I mean, I think there, yeah, there's 
when you came to New York, I remember like you know these day long workshops where we would get what felt like five months worth <laughs> of work done in, in tw like twelve hours. Um, I mean, I think that this it's a like kind of crazy exhibition, right? Like it's. The, the fundamental claim feels vaguely, it's like intuitive, right? It's like you see the connections, you understand, you see the pieces, and you're like, yeah, I get it. Like, the, you know, there's a lot of layers to the story. There's the kind of thesis, which is like the overarching thing, which makes a lot of sense. But then under that thesis is like a lot of content. And I think like whether one chooses to be super disciplined and rigorous about how they access that content, you could, you know, we could talk for an hour about one object in the show, right? And what that, not only what it represents in a more global sense, but also just what that object is. We could describe an object for an hour. They're so complex, they're so amazing. Everything is embedded with like its own incredible story, its own provenance. So uh, I don't know, I feel like this is the kind of spirit of how the meetings went, how the design process went, and how the show is. Likewise, I think any of you, if you went out to, to the show, you could just walk through it in 10 minutes, honestly, and, and kind of get it. I mean, not, that's in no way meant to be disrespectful to like all the work that we've all done and that you guys have put into it, but you will have some layer of understanding of it. Another one of you might go in and just sit down in one room for a day, and you still won't get the whole story. And I just find that really interesting, and I think that really under, like, undergirded how we communicated with each other. Because sometimes like these meetings would just go on and you'd be like, what? How? We're on the first room. <laughs> it's, been, it's been like two hours and the my computer's about to die. It's the first time I, when I came up to New York, I was like, we have to start at the end of the show because we never talk about yeah. the end. We can never, we make, never it make it, it there. We'd, to the end. We'd have five hour <laughs> meetings. I would go through like three Bluetooth headphones like dying on me. I'd have my backup, a backup, a backup, and I would still lose them all and uh, and you wouldn't get anywhere. And I, 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 like, I kind of love that. There's like this very nerdy side of me that just finds that incredibly compelling. Um, but it was also frustrating at times. I think too, the hard part, like I was looking at your kind of typologies and breakdowns is there were so many pieces that could have been standalones or so many, so yeah. there were, there's so many pieces that could be in multiple places within the show. And that was hard sometimes to, to be like, what is the best piece in the show for these moments and what can tell the biggest story or the most isolated story. And so. Um, even just like those hero objects and tr kind of breaking down what would be those things was, um, I think once we kind of anchored some of those, it helped. Yeah. That's a good segue actually, because I was curious, Sarah, from the DMA curatorial museum perspective, what was your initial concept in your mind when you started all those years ago? When you sort of thought about these objects in a space, did the final result end up what you had envisioned in your mind? Can you talk a little bit about what you envisioned? Oh. Uh, yeah, I think, <laughs> I mean, uh, we'll I'm, so, offers I'm so excited about this answer. <laughs> was wondering, like, it was a long time like? ago. No, I remember because I, um, at, the, at the time we were first talking about it, there was just um, two, two cur curators on the team. And I remember having this very intense conversation because um, my French counterpart was saying, I want to put one Islamic object in the center and then all this jewelry around it and we'll have like lily pads of them. And I was like, that will never happen. <laughs> and, and I think it was just, it was just that starting with that idea of, I think this idea of layering was really um, interesting to me. And I, I was going through old notebooks I had from those meetings of really talking about um, lenses of like this kind of, you're looking forward, you're looking back. It's, kind, it's not an A to B to C story. It's always these filters and layers and stuff. And I think that, um, so I don't know what I imagined, but I imagined something more complicated and less literal. And I think that that's what we got. I feel like what I love about the show is I go through all the time and see new things. I make new connections. And mm -hmm. I think even when we, as we moved the installation along, one of the decisions we made here was to really remove a lot of text and really let the objects breathe. Um, in these big cases and really kind of be almost this kind of type, you know, typology of ideas. And the idea was really to force people to really look, to start making those connections themselves because on one way they're obvious, but on another you take them for granted. And we, um, you know, I think if you're not training people to trust their own eye, then you're not building the next generation of, of kind of great creative thinkers because that's how you become inspired by things. Yeah, I think that's such a nice point. Like, you know, I, I've obviously talked a lot about interpretation and used that word a lot today, but 
leaving open inter like the act of interpretation as a possibility for anyone who's seeing the show is super important. You know, like you want everyone should be able to interpret. And I remember even when we were picking like the four zoom ins, like um, because that was really kind of a, a very small group of us. And you're trying to figure out where, what's in the room, what, and I, I remember I picked that little brooch, and yeah. you were like, that brooch, that should not be so big. <laughs> and I was like, but it's so small, no one will see it unless you blow it up. And then you blow it up and you realize, oh, you just, you see things so differently. And I think that was, when we had people from Cartier who deal with those jewelry every day come to us during the installation and say, I'm seeing things I've never seen before in these objects. I feel like it was such a it was such a great moment because yeah. it's like everybody is finding something new. It, yeah, and the layers really are incredible. Just it's a staggeringly beautiful show. I mean, it's it's really impressive. Um, and I think that's a good note to end on. We have run out of time, but uh, I think that the work that you all have I'm both surprise our Zoom session has ended. <laughs> yeah. My headphones died. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I want to thank you both. Um, obviously, this was a large team effort, but the um, getting to hear from you both and sharing your knowledge with everybody here has been such a treat. So thank you both for joining us. Yeah, thanks thank for having you. us.